In this primer, we'll see that occlusion myocardial infarction, or OMI, is a physiologic paradigm which places the underlying pathology at the top of the schema rather than a single segment of the ECG. We will review a relatively simple 8-10 to 10 step approach for identifying OMIs, employing rules which carry a high level of specificity, and we'll see how artificial intelligence can help assist us in making these decisions. And regarding the importance of OMI identification, we'll review the data that informs us that time is tissue, looking at studies which demonstrate a two-fold mortality increase in OMIs compared to their non-occluded counterparts, which make up at least 25% of all NSTEMIs we're currently treating. Traditionally, healthcare providers are taught to dichotomize acute coronary syndromes on the basis of the ST segment. If the ST segment is significantly elevated, the acute coronary syndrome is classified as a STEMI. And if the ST segment is not significantly elevated, it's classified as an NSTEMI. Pathologically, STEMIs are assumed to manifest when a coronary artery is completely occluded by a red, RBC-rich thrombus, whereas NSTEMIs are assumed to manifest when a coronary artery is incompletely occluded by a white, platelet-rich thrombus. This dichotomy is important because it shapes the way we think about patient management. For STEMIs, we feel a great sense of urgency to help expedite these patients to the cath lab, ideally to facilitate a door-to-balloon time of less than 90 minutes. For NSTEMIs, the guidelines remind us that in most circumstances, patients can be safely managed on a heparin drip for 24 to 48 hours prior to cardiac catheterization. In this paradigm, STEMIs are believed to reflect complete coronary artery occlusion, while NSTEMIs are believed to reflect incomplete occlusion. If this were a perfect paradigm, we would expect perfect overlap between patients with complete coronary occlusion and those with STEMIs. But in reality, we know this isn't true. About 30% of STEMIs turn out to be false positives, and 30% turn out to be false negatives. Of course, we can't really refer to this group as false negatives because if they didn't have significant elevation of their ST segments, they're not false negatives, they're just NSTEMIs. And despite the completely occluded vessel below, management will likely favor slower transport to the cath lab. Proponents of the OMI-NOMI paradigm prefer to put the presumed underlying pathology at the top of their schema, rather than a single segment of the ECG. They then look for ECG findings that are associated with a high specificity for acute coronary occlusion. This does not ignore ST segment elevation, but rather expands beyond it to capture the current subset of NSTEMIs that have total coronary artery occlusion. Proponents of the STEMI-NSTEMI paradigm will argue that it is a physiologic paradigm. They'll remind you that it all comes down to the potassium, or K, ATP channel. Myocyte depolarization starts with an influx of sodium through a voltage-gated sodium channel. This is followed by a brief efflux of potassium, followed by the simultaneous influx of calcium, balanced by the efflux of potassium, generating the plateau phase of the myocyte action potential, followed by the opening of several additional voltage-gated potassium channels, resulting in the repolarization of the cardiac myocyte. One of the important channels for maintaining the resting membrane potential of the cardiac myocyte is not voltage-gated, but nucleotide-gated, specifically by ATP and ADP. When ATP is abundant, the channel remains closed, helping to maintain an extracellular potassium concentration of just 4 millimole, compared to the intracellular concentration of 155 millimole. When these two concentrations are funneled through the NERST equation, a resting membrane potential of about negative 85 millivolts falls out. During ischemia, ADP predominates, resulting in the opening of the K-ATP channel. Now, when the increased extracellular concentration of potassium goes from 4 millimole to 10 millimole, when it's funneled through the NERST equation, a new resting membrane potential of negative 60 millivolts falls out. Importantly, the plateau phase of the myocyte action potential falls. As time progresses and the cell is deprived of more oxygen, the extracellular potassium concentration continues to rise to almost 20 millimole. This results in an even higher resting membrane potential and an even lower plateau potential. Flat 
Isoelectric segments of the ECG waveform occur when there is no electric gradient between overlapping myocardial oxygen potentials. Under normal physiologic conditions, in the absence of ischemia, this tends to produce the PR and TP segments, seen here in yellow, and the ST segment, seen here in red. Since ischemic myocardial cells have higher resting membrane potentials and lower plateau potentials than their non-ischemic myocardial neighbors, a current is generated by the electric gradient. From the perspective of the ECG electrode, in the setting of subendocardial ischemia, the first myocardial tissue it sees is the non-ischemic myocardium, whose corresponding action potential starts off more negative than its non-ischemic neighbor. This reverses during the plateau phase of the action potential, where the ischemic myocardial plateau potential is more negative than the non-ischemic plateau potential. This reverses once again at the end of the myocardial action potential as the ischemic resting membrane potential is more positive than the non-ischemic resting membrane potential. The current produced by these electric gradients always flows from more positive to more negative. The current is referred to as the current of injury. When the current of injury travels toward the ECG electrode, it shifts the ECG tracing upward. When the current of injury travels away from the electrode, it shifts the ECG tracing downward. The ECG machine then attempts to zero the tracing along the TP segment. The net result in the uh, setting of subendocardial ischemia is an ST segment depression. In the setting of transmural ischemia, the perspective of the ECG electrode reverses. Now, the first myocardial tissue it sees is the ischemic myocardium. Consequently, now the current of injury runs away from the electrode at the beginning of the action potential, resulting in a downward shift of the ECG tracing. Once again, the current reverses during the plateau phase, resulting in an upward shift of the ECG tracing, and reverses once more at the end of the action potential, producing the characteristic elevation of the ST segment associated with STEMIs. Due to the three-dimensional nature of the vector of injury, we can anticipate that the ST segment elevations and depressions will correspond to leads overlying regions of infarcted myocardium. This produces the characteristic patterns we associate with anterior, inferior, lateral, and posterior STEMIs. In reality, we find that these STEMI patterns are associated with a roughly 15 to 30% false positive rate and miss 25 to 30 percent of acute thrombotic occlusions. By the numbers, NSTEMIs account for about 70 percent of acute coronary syndromes, while STEMIs account for the remaining 30. But as mentioned earlier, about one in four NSTEMIs are found to have total thrombotic occlusion at the time of cath. Under the STEMI and STEMI paradigm, the latest guidelines do not provide guidance on how to identify this subgroup of NSTEMIs. They do, however, remind us that in the absence of cardiogenic shock, refractory angina, or hemodynamic instability, high-risk NSTEMIs, with gray scores greater than 140, should undergo cath within 24 hours, citing the TIMAX and verdict trials. The TIMAX trial looked at early versus delayed invasive intervention in acute coronary syndrome. It found that an early invasive strategy, defined as cardiac cath within less than 24 hours, with a median time to cath of about 14 hours, did not improve outcomes with respect to death, MI, or CVA, compared to a delayed invasive strategy defined as cath greater than 36 hours with a median of 50 hours. That is, unless patients were high risk with gray scores greater than 140 who seemed to do better with the early invasive strategy. The verdict trial similarly looked at an early versus delayed invasive strategy for patients with NSTEMIs. Here, the early invasive strategy was defined as less than 12 hours, with a median of 4 hours, compared to a delayed invasive strategy of 48 to 72 hours, with a median of 62 hours. Once again, there was no improvement in MACE with respect to death, MI, heart failure, or rehospitalization, unless the grade scores were greater than 140, in which the early invasive strategy was favored. If, however, the patient has significant elevation of the ST segment, wherein we presume the underlying coronary artery is completely occluded, we know that time is tissue, 
numerous trials since the 1990s have demonstrated a linear relationship between time to cardiac cap and mortality in patients with STEMI. Whether it's 30-day mortality, in-hospital mortality, or one-year mortality. But if that same occluded vessel does not result in elevation of the ST segment, does time to reperfusion truly become less important? Insight into this question can be gleaned from a 2017 meta-analysis of end STEMIs with total occlusion of the culprit artery. In this study, they found that of the 40,000 end STEMIs that underwent investigation, about 25% had total occlusion at the time of calf. Total occlusion was associated with a roughly 1.7-fold increase in the rate of mortality, and of those who survived, a 1.4-fold increase in the rate of MACE. Breaking this trial down, the largest trial, which included 30,000 patients, demonstrated an almost two-fold increase in in-hospital mortality for those end STEMIs that were found to have total thrombotic occlusion. This trend was consistent across multiple trials, with the smaller study demonstrating a 1.5-fold increase in mortality. And this smaller study of 500 patients showing a 2.4-fold increase in 30-day mortality. Practitioners who have adopted the OMI-NOMI paradigm have found that compared to patients with STEMI, those who are OMI positive but STEMI negative make it to the cath lab about 10 times later, with an average door to cath time of 237 minutes or 7.3 hours in one particular study. And this delayed time to cath was associated with a roughly two-fold increase in in-hospital mortality. So is there something we can do to identify this important subgroup of NSTEMIs who have total thrombotic occlusion to help expedite their transport to the cath lab with the same degree of certainty and urgency that we do for STEMIs? One of the more elegant and concise articles which offers a solution to this problem is titled Recognizing Electrocardiographically Subtle Occlusion Myocardial Infarction and Differentiating It from Mimics, 10 Steps to or Away from the Cath Lab. This article was written by a Turkish cardiologist, Dr. Aslanger, and two of his U.S. colleagues who have been pioneers of the OMI-NOMI paradigm, Dr. Stephen Smith and Dr. Pendle Myers. Although their article breaks down OMIs into 10 steps, I am going to focus on just eight of them in this presentation. Broadly, they can be broken down between those associated with significant ST elevation and those without significant ST elevation. Because we know several other conditions can result in ST elevation, the first three steps involve distinguishing OMIs from mimics of STEMI. The remaining steps involve identifying more subtle but specific changes associated with OMI. Ideally, we would like these rules to be highly specific, and it turns out they are. As the OMI-NOMI paradigm originated in the realm of emergency medicine, it is perhaps not surprising that many of the validation studies have been published in emergency medicine journals. Recently, however, cardiology journals have started to publish validations of these rules as well. And the ACC has endorsed several of them in their latest 2022 consensus statement for managing patients with chest pain in the emergency department. Step one, two, and three are to rule out mimics of STEMI. We expect to see ST elevation in the presence of a left bundle branch block or ventricularly paced rhythm. Applying the Scarbosa or Smith modified Scarbosa criteria can help to determine whether there is an occluded coronary artery hiding beneath the expected ST elevation. This isn't particularly new, but what is new is that the 2022 ACC expert consensus decision pathway on the evaluation of acute uh, chest pain in the emergency department now recognizes it as a STEMI equivalent. In short, concordant ST changes, either elevations or depressions, are concerning, while discordant changes are expected, unless they're excessive. Here's an example of a left bundle branch block in the absence of acute ischemia. We see concordant ST elevation in leads B1 through B3, meaning that the ST segment elevation is opposite in direction 
of the preceding QRS complex. Since this elevation is less than 25% of the preceding S wave, it is not concerning for occlusion myocardial infarction. Here is a 65-year-old man who presented with substernal chest pain. Here we see concordant elevation in leads 1 and AVL, uh, which are indicative of underlying acute coronary occlusion. Here is another example of concordant ST elevation in an 85-year-old woman who presented with substernal chest pain. Notably, although there is concordant ST depression in leads 3 and ABF, this does not technically count under Scarboso criteria, which only includes concordant ST uh, depression in leads V1 through V3 as criteria for OMI. In this example, we see both concordant ST depression in the precordium as well as excessive ST elevation in the inferior leads. Excessive ST elevation is defined as ST elevation that is greater than 25% in amplitude of the preceding S wave. The next STEMI mimic we'll address um, is that which may be produced by LVH. This example comes from the blog of Dr. Steve Smith. In this case, the 23-year-old man presented without symptoms of acute coronary syndrome, but with ECG findings of convex and flattened ST segment elevation in the precordium. Under most circumstances, convex and or flat ST segment elevation tend to be more concerning for OMI, but in this circumstance, that's not the case. It's very unusual to find OMIs that preserve LVH voltage criteria. The deep S waves seen in V3 and V4 provide reassurance that the ST segment elevation is less likely from OMI. In this example, also borrowed from Dr. Steve Smith's ECG blog, we see an example of a patient who had a baseline ECG finding with deep precordial S waves meeting criteria for LVH. When this patient presented to the emergency department with chest pain at time point zero, we see some of that S wave amplitude has diminished. Repeat ECG 230 minutes later shows further shrinking of the precordial S waves. And by 245 minutes, it meets clear STEMI criteria and no longer meets voltage criteria for LVH. The last STEMI mimic we will cover in this presentation is pericarditis. Here is a case of a 66-year-old woman presenting with chest heaviness and dyspnea. There is somewhat diffuse ST segment elevation across the anterior, lateral, and inferior territories. One reassuring pattern that this does not represent OMI is the ST segment elevation in lead 2 is greater than the ST segment elevation in lead 3, which is more often seen in pericarditis. One study found this pattern present in 49 of 49 patients discharged with a diagnosis of pericarditis between 1996 and 2012. That same study found that ST segment elevation was greater in lead 3 compared to lead 2 in 88% of patients with angiographically inferior STEMIs, with only 4% having ST segment elevation in lead 2 greater than lead 3. At first glance, this case may look similar. Once again, we find somewhat diffuse ST segment elevation across the anterior, lateral, and inferior territories, which may look similar to our last case. If we try to apply our previous rule, it's hard to say whether the elevation in 2 is greater than the elevation in lead 3. The important finding on this ECG, however, lies in lead AVL. Importantly, there's ST segment depression. Any ST segment depression in lead AVL favors OMI over pericarditis. That same study referenced in the last case found that this rule has a specificity of 100%. Not a single case of pericarditis has ST depression in lead AVL, but of the 154 angiographically confirmed inferior STEMIs, all had some degree of ST segment depression in AVL. One hour later, the ECG from this case met clear STEMI criteria. The next OMI pattern we'll discuss is Wellens. To understand the Wellens pattern, it's helpful to understand the natural progression of acute coronary occlusion. The first electrocardiographic finding after a coronary artery becomes occluded might be a hyperacute T wave. This may be followed by elevation of the ST segment, followed by the development of Q waves, followed by T wave inversion, 
followed by T-wave recovery, or in some instances, persistent ST elevation, also known as aneurysmal morphology. If the artery reperfuses at some point, either via autolysis or PCI, we will usually see the following progression of ECG changes. First, we might see terminal T-wave inversion, followed by slightly deeper T-wave inversion, which over time becomes deeper and more symmetric. This is essentially the pattern we see in Wellens, which occurs during a state of autolysis, when the previously completely occluded vessel reperfuses. Although it is open at the time of ECG acquisition, we know that these lesions are very unstable and prone to occluding, which could happen at any time. Here is a case of a 56-year-old man who presented to our emergency department with intermittent chest pain for the past day. He was asymptomatic at the time this ECG was acquired. Cardiac cath revealed a 100% thrombotic occlusion of his proximal LAD hours later. Here is a case of a 70-year-old man who presented with substernal chest pain that woke him from sleep. Once again, he was asymptomatic by the time he was evaluated in the emergency department. ECG reveals precordial terminal T-wave inversion, classic for Wellens morphology. A few hours later, we find deepening of the terminal T-wave inversion, still consistent with Wellens. Cardiac cath later revealed an 85% thrombotic occlusion of his distal LED. It's not surprising that the lesion was not 100% occluded, as this morphology occurs in the setting of autolysis. Here's a case of a 46-year-old man who was experiencing intermittent chest pain for the past two days. Like the previous two cases, he was asymptomatic at the time of this ECG acquisition. Once again, we see terminal T-wave inversion, suspicious for Wellens. And once again, upon cardiac cath, he was found with a 100% occlusion of his mid-LAD. Here is his ECG post-PCI, with expected reperfusion pattern. And here is his ECG two months after PCI, with return of upright precordial T-waves. The next two group of OMIs described in this paper include the eponymous Aslanger's pattern and South African flag pattern, as well as other findings of subtle ST elevation. I'm going to summarize these two categories with the following rule. Reciprocal changes are concerning for OMI. Here's a 41-year-old woman who presented with intermittent chest pain for three days after an unexpected divorce. Although this ECG does not meet semi-criteria, we can identify some concerning findings of OMI. First, there appear appears to be mild ST depression in the inferior leads, with reciprocal ST elevation in AVL. Enlarged here for clarity. And although technically the four-variable subtle anterior semi-formula should not be applied when there is such reciprocal changes, it happens to be useful in this case. The four-variable formula for subtle anterior STEMI was derived by Dr. Smith to help differentiate subtle anterior ST elevation from benign early repolarization. When applied to this case, we get a value of 20.7. Any score greater than 18.2 is suggestive of OMI, with a specificity of 95% and a positive likelihood ratio of 16. Looking at the actual formula, we find that it incorporates the QTC, the amplitude of the QRS complex in V2, the R waves amplitude in V4, and ST elevation in V3. At this point, I imagine your eyes might be glazing over, and you might be thinking that this is too much math to do in the middle of an important decision that could result in activation of the cath lab. And that's why it's easier to just plug the numbers into the calculator that you can find on MDCalc. Looking at this case, we find that the amplitude of the QRS complex in V2 is 7 millimeters. The amplitude of the R wave is 9 millimeters. And the degree of ST elevation, as measured 60 milliseconds from the J point relative to the PR segment, is 2 millimeters. With a formula value greater than 18.2, our suspicion for OMI is elevated. Sure enough, upon cardiac cath, this patient was found to have 99% occlusion of her distal LED. Looking once more at the formula, we find that it tells us that anterior OMI tends to shrink the QRS and R wave amplitude in V2 and V4 respectively, and elevate the ST segment in V3. 
But what I personally find more helpful than the formula itself are its exclusion criteria. When validating this formula, Dr. Smith specifically excluded cases where OMI was obvious. One important obvious OMI finding that tends to be left out of traditional medical school teaching is terminal QRS distortion. Terminal QRS distortion refers to any amount of ST segment elevation with absence of both an S wave and a J wave. If this finding is present in either V2 or V3, it's very specific for OMI. Here's an example from a 29-year-old patient who presented with substernal chest pain. If we zoom in to lead V3, we find that there is no true S wave. It terminates before the baseline. This is essentially diagnostic for an anterior OMI. But the absence of an S wave in V2 or V3 does not automatically confirm OMI it must also lack a J-wave. Here's an example from a different patient who similarly does not have an S-wave and leave the V3. The difference in this case is that there is a J-wave. If a J-wave is present, OMI is less likely. Unfortunately, the 29-year-old patient in this case subsequently suffered a V-fib arrest and was later found to have a 100% thrombotic occlusion of his LAD. This 2016 paper by Dr. Smith found that terminal QRS distortion was never observed in benign early repolarization pattern, with a specificity for LAD occlusion of 100%. Here's one last case from our emergency department. A 44-year-old man presented due to substernal chest pain after exercise. His ECG demonstrates mild ST elevation and lead V2. Importantly, there's no S wave or J wave in V2 and thus we can say there is terminal QRS distortion. Subsequent cath revealed a 90% thrombotic lesion of his mid-LAD. The next set of OMIs includes posterior and de Winter T waves, both of which are now classified as STEMI equivalents in the 2022 ACC consensus pathway for chest pain in the emergency department. Here is a case of a 48-year-old man who presented to our emergency department with substernal chest pain for five hours associated with nausea and emesis. This is unusual and concerning as most individuals, if anything, have mild ST elevation in V2 or V3. Cardiac cath revealed a 100% thrombotic occlusion of his proximal RCA and was stented. A recently published paper by Dr. Smith and Dr. Myers demonstrated that ST segment depression that is maximal in V1 through V4 of any amplitude compared to V5 through V6 is specific for OMI with a specificity of 97%. And in this study, 34% of the cases which were angiographically confirmed OMIs had less than one millimeter of ST depression in V1 through V4. Here's a case of a 70 year old man who presented with substernal chest pain for one hour. Once again, we find that there is ST depression that's maximal in V3 through V4. Unlike our previous case, however, this time there is associated hyperacute T waves. This finding of precordial hyperacute T waves associated with ST depression is referred to as de Winter pattern. This pattern is very suggestive for proximal LAD occlusion. And sure enough, after this patient was rushed to the cath lab, he was found with a 100% thrombotic occlusion of his proximal LAD. The last OMI pattern I will cover is hyperacute T waves, which is now also considered a semi equivalent. Here is a case of a 50 year old man who came to the emergency department with five hours of intermittent chest pain. The ED physicians were concerned that the T waves of this ECG were hyperacute and represented OMI. Sure enough, a thrombotic mid-LAD lesion was found on cath several hours after. Now, if you found this ECG challenging, you're not alone. The best paper out there on hyperacute T waves reminds us that there's no formal ECG definition. At best, expert consensus defines them as an increased area under the curve of the T wave relative to the QRS complex. Here, they demonstrate that the T wave area to the QRS amplitude ratio is greater than two in a hyperacute T wave, whereas it's less than one in normal T waves. I find that the best way to get used to identifying hyperacute T waves is to just look at lots of examples, many of which can be found on Dr. Smith's ECG blog.
Here's an example from his blog of a 75-year-old woman who presented with five days of intermittent heartburn. Notably, however, her T waves could be considered hyperacute. And sure enough, she was found to have a 100% thrombotic occlusion on cath. Zooming in on her precordial leads, we find that the ratio of the area under the curve of the T wave relative to the QRS complex is rather large. Here is what her T waves looked like at baseline. Superimposed, we see that when she arrived to the emergency department, her T waves were much larger, and the QRS complexes had shrunk. Moreover, the slope of the T wave has flattened, and it takes off almost immediately after the QRS complex. As time progresses, the T waves continue to inflate. And by eight minutes, they are starting to meet stemming criteria. Returning to our objectives, we've seen that OMIs are a physiologic paradigm, that time is tissue, and that some of these findings can be subtle and require a fair bit of practice. But the other way to identify OMIs is using artificial intelligence. A recently published paper on the use of artificial intelligence in ECG interpretation states, the accurate diagnosis of acute coronary syndrome is probably the main challenge of deep learning in artificial intelligence systems. But one of the first solutions may be the queen of hearts. Not this queen of hearts, but this queen of hearts. An artificial intelligence model which is being trained by OMI experts, Dr. Smith and Dr. Myers, the very authors of the paper that we've been reviewing. And they've teamed up with their friends across the pond at a company called Powerful Medical to train an application called PM Cardio, which allows you to upload a picture of an ECG and get immediate feedback about whether it thinks that there is underlying acute ischemia. Returning to the first example of a hyperacute T-wave that we looked at, the model predicted with high confidence that this was an OMI, and can deliver the message packed within a clear graphical user interface. In summary, we've seen that OMI is a physiologic paradigm that places the underlying pathology at the top of their schema, rather than a single segment of the ECG. We've seen that we can identify OMIs using a relatively simple 8 to 10 step approach using rules that carry a high degree of specificity, and that artificial intelligence will likely soon be assisting us in making these decisions. And regarding the importance of OMI identification, we were reminded that time is tissue, and that large studies have demonstrated a twofold mortality increase in OMIs, which make up at least 25% of all end STEMIs that we're currently treating. So perhaps the next time you get called to evaluate an ECG of a patient with chest pain, rather than thinking STEMI versus NSTEMI, you'll be thinking OMI versus NOMI.